Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dancing Sober Podcast. And like always, I want to give a shout out to our sponsors. Thank you to Picaresca Cafe. Picaresca Cafe is a little coffee shop out by Soto and Olympic. The address is down here below. And um, they have food pop-ups and they make the best Americano. That's my favorite. So come out to Picaresca Cafe. They are also the roasters of our coffee bags. Um, we will have these coffee bags for sale at Caminarte this Friday. So come out to Caminarte at Espacio this Friday. You can also pick them up at Sugar Kiss Boutique on Cesar Chavez and Ford. So please come out and get some of these beautiful coffee bags. Also, I'm going to have some uh, holiday special bags. So look out for those. I want to give a shout out to Espacio, our home base. Um, we are not in Espacio today, but they are still our home base. So don't forget to go to espacio1839.com to look for things to shop for Christmas or come into the store. Uh, check them out. You can find them on Instagram as well, espacio1839. A big shout out this week to Esquina Bicycle Shop. Esquina Bicycle Shop is over on Whittier and Boyle. And of course, they also have the holiday specials. Come out and get a bike for your nephews, nieces, and ahados so that um, they can ride around. But be safe. Don't forget to get a helmet. You can find Esquina on Instagram as well, Esquina Bicycle Shop. And they also have a website, Esquina, Esquina.la. And the information is down below in the links. This week, we are not, you've noticed now that we're not at Espacio, and uh, we are in the studio of a very special artist. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Judith Hernandez. <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dancing Sober Podcast, and today we are more than honored to be sitting inside of a studio, of an artist studio, not, not a television studio, but this is our first in-house visit with the legendary <laughs> artist, muralist, Judith Hernandez. Very nice to be here, thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you for having me, thank you so much, thank, mm -hmm. and thank you for having everybody come and Take a peek into your studio. I mean, we're not going to walk around and do the whole thing. This is a no, podcast. We're not do that. This, is, <laughs> this is a podcast. Um, so, you know, it's more of a conversation and um, mm -hmm. more of like I, I'm, I'm trying to get people to know the artists more and I don't know, just conversation. <laughs> An excuse yeah. to have coffee and conversation. Yeah, exactly. An excuse <laughs> to um, get to meet a lot of people and get to um, also um, archive all this and, and share it with a lot of people. So. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Okay. Yeah. Who should we roast? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. If we could roast somebody, who would it be? Yeah. I don't want to do that. Um, yeah. So let's start a little bit of just with you, like I always do with all of the po these podcasts. Mm -hmm. Just start with um, yourself and a little bit about like where you grew up and how you grew up. And okay. Well, where you uh, from? I grew up in Lincoln Heights. Um, I was born in the South Central. Mm. and We only lived there until... My brother was uh, kindergarten age, and then we moved to Lincoln Heights. So basically, Lincoln Heights is all that I recall. What years? I was born in 48, and I think we moved uh, in 53 to Lincoln Heights from uh, 47th and Figueroa area, which is like near SC, I guess, Exposition Park. Yeah. And um, I went to Griffith, Griffin Elementary, went to Lincoln. In those days, Lincoln was... Uh, a six-year mm. educational experience from seven to to twelve, and then um, uh, from there, I I did a couple of years at ELAC to do general education requirements mm. before transferring to Otis in 1969. Let's let's go back a little bit because I'd like to find out like what kind of what kind of teenager were you like you know were you a traviesa ah, were you good not with my mother studied? no way. <laughs> I couldn't even go on a date. I mean, no, 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 no. She was the the um, the very traditional Mexican mother. She was an interesting woman because she, for her generation, because not only was she, you know, inherently a, a really smart, uh, self-possessed, assertive woman, hmm. although she was only four <laughs> eleven. Uh, she always said she was five feet tall, which was a lie. That's funny. Um, but she uh, had also had uh, a partial uh, college education. Mm. Her father, who was uh, my grandfather, which who was, was pretty rare back then. Very rare. Yeah. He believed he was he was uh, an amazing guy. Her dad, who he was from Mexico originally, mm. 
But he believed in women's suffrage. He supported women's suffrage because that hadn't happened. You know, when, what, uh, 1919? Was it when women got the vote here in the, the United sure, States? Yeah. And my mother was born in 1914. Mm. But he already had campaigned for that, which embarrassed his wife, I think, because wow. she was very traditional. And he wanted his daughters. He had two daughters, my mother and, and her older sister. And he encouraged both of them to do exactly what they wanted to do as long as they were willing to pay any consequences that it involved. Mm. So he said, if you want to smoke and drink, fine, as long as you can pay for it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I am not paying for it. <laughs> you want to go to school? I will pay for you to go to school. So she went to college. I think she was at one of the, you know, she was, they, she grew up in El Paso. Mm. And I think she went to one of the, um, the, the you know, University of Texas schools. I don't know which one it was, but it was only for a couple of years because then the Depression hit. Mm. And although he had a good job, he was a, a chef for the old Fred Harvey restaurant that used to be in all the train stations. Oh, wow. Yeah, he was a great oh. cook. He spoke seven languages. He was an interesting man. I wish I'd known him more. Um, she was, you know, she... she absolutely valued education above everything else. Mm -hmm. She used to tell my brother and I, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter that you don't have wealth, that you don't have a social position. What matters is what's, what you put between your ears. Mm -hmm. that, will, that will help you make, the, make your way through life. It may be more difficult for you. She told my brother and I one day, very frankly, she told my brother, you have two strikes against you. You're poor and you're Mexican. Hmm. And then she looked at me and she said, you have three. You're, <laughs> you're poor, you're Mexican, and you're a woman. Ugh. So you have to try you know, twice as hard, three times as hard. And so you must know what they know. Hmm. And she was very frank about that. I mean, she had no, I mean, she was, she how, was not a race. How many racist. siblings did you have? Just one. Just one. Yeah. <clears throat> and, you know, she, she didn't regard, you know, white, white, Europeans as, um, as the enemy, hmm. but they were the standard for the country. Got it. And if you were going to succeed, you had to, you didn't need to be like them. Culturally, you know, we were Mexican. But assimilation we, was huge back then, right? I know. And she did not want us to assimilate, yeah. but she, but she also had moved in a world that was really different. And if anybody who knows El Paso from the post-war mm. period, it was kind awesome. of like a, uh, a city that's usually on, you know, a port, mm. where you have all kinds of people crossing, and there's all this this cultural integration. El Paso was like that in that Euro um, European immigrants, uh, maybe from the, the beginning of the 20th century, had emigrated to the Southwest, and El Paso seemed to be an attractive place to come to. She had Assyrian friends. She had Italian mm. friends. She they would cross the border freely to Juarez. She had, she had, Wonderful cousin. Yeah, it Frankie. explains a lot. Yeah. Yeah, and we, you know, we, as a child, I have great memories of what Wattis was like. So she was a very cosmopolitan, interesting mm. woman, very well read. She was not like the regular, you know, mom mm. uh, that you would find in East LA. Mm -hmm. And she made sure that, you know, that her kids, you know, what other people did with their children was their business. But, you know, she said, if you bring attention to yourself, it would, should always be positive. Mm. And this is a cute story. We were sitting at dinner one night. I was in high school, and the phone rang. And my mother answered it, and she said, My daughter? No, that's not my daughter. My daughter is sitting here at the dinner table. And I thought, <laughs> <laughs> what the hell's going on? So she hung up. She said, Do you ever go downtown with so and so? I said, Not today. <laughs> Well, she's been, she's been, they called me from, I don't know, Bullocks or something, May Company, that this person had been shoplifting, and she said that she was me. Wow. Yeah, and my mother was outraged. I don't know if she ever had a conversation with this girl's mother, but <laughs> she said, no, that's not my daughter. She's right here having dinner with me. So I said, oh, my God. Did you figure out who that person was? No, she, she's very discreet. Hmm. You know, there was no reason for us to fall out. You know, the, this girl, I mean... Yeah. I don't know, kids do the dumbest yeah, thing. Yeah. She wasn't going to punish her for life just because she did something stupid. The stupidest thing was to not be honest and yeah. then try to pass the blame onto her friend, right? But what, um, what years did your mom move to East L.A.? 
when did you win? When did they, they come to East LA? You said oh, it? God, it must have been like 1953. Okay. So I was born in 48 in Venice Hospital, which is also on the South Central side. And then, mm-hmm. um, yeah, it was 1953 or so. Um, yeah, and so... It, the world of Northeast Los Angeles has always been where I lived yeah, yeah. <clears throat> until I left for Chicago in 1984. And, and it's the world that I came back to in yeah. 2010 when I came back with my daughter this time. So l- let's go back uh, to um, when you first started um, maybe drawing or feeling that art was something that you liked. My mother would show me drawings that I had done. She saved these things. I don't know where they are anymore. I'm sorry I didn't. was a more respectful of her, you know, her wanting to verify this, you know, this, this path that I was on. But she said that I, I drew from the time that I could hold something, wow. you know, in my hand. She had drawings from a two-year-old that were actually pretty good. <laughs> I saw them. I mean, they were complete thoughts. You know how yeah. kids draw isolated floating things? Yeah, yeah. And I would draw, I would fill the entire page with a scene of some sort. I mean, it all made sense. And um, by the time I, I was in the school system, and it's probably one of the, the things that, you know, I was so blessed with that, you know, that what ability I had was noticed by teachers who cared. These were not... These teachers were not Mexican American. They were all white, but they loved what they did. These, you know, mostly women, um, and they 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 made every effort, you know, to encourage, you know, my abilities and give me opportunities. And if it wasn't for them, I I don't know if I actually would have pursued seriously considered pursued a career in art. But I couldn't do it since else. elementary. Wow. Yeah, That's since really elementary. So when I was. Awesome. When I was in the sixth grade, my teacher, who had some kind of inn at Disney Studios, mm. sent in sent in some drawings or pictures of drawings that I had done uh, for some kind of internship for high. They were for high school mm. students, and I was only in sixth grade. And they they offered me a job for the summer, and then you know we had to turn it down. I said, "Well, she's twelve. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Sorry, she has to be fifteen to work. Oh shoot! Actually, it was a good thing. I I didn't. I wouldn't want to, have, you know, to 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 be, you know, sucked into the Disney, yeah, you know, cyclone and what. That's to, true. At that age, yeah, you would. I didn't want to be that. No, no, no. <coughs> but um, yeah, I mean, they were just very, you know. I had a high school teacher who was probably the most influential, who uh, gave me a, a private studio right off of the wow. main classroom. Because she recognized that I don't need to do this stuff she's giving them. Wow. I need a space where I can create myself. You yeah. know who inherited that studio after I left? Huh. Leo Limon. Wow. Isn't that crazy? Wow. <laughs> what, what school was this at? Lincoln. At Lincoln High School. Yeah, Mrs. Yeah. Downey. She was an amazing woman. She was um, friends with, um, uh, I, nobody knows who he is anymore, which is a shame, uh, Joseph Muyaini, who is... Mm. He's the artist, if you've ever read Ray Bradbury and yeah. seen the original books, mm. he's the, they were great friends, and he illustrated all of his books. Wow. And he was a wonderful illustrator, artist. He, was, uh, he wasn't an immigrant. I think his parents came from Italy. So this teacher probably having a connection to the art world saw the possibilities yes. and knew that he yes. needed a studio and to, I think, to work. And this is me just spitballing, but I sense now as an adult yeah. that she was a woman who would have... W- wanted a career, but mm. given when she was born mm. and her social status in life, whatever, she seemed mm. upper middle class. There was no way they were going to allow her to be mm. a fine artist. Mm. So in her in her students, she always found people that disappointed her. Mm. She thought they were going to make it, and then mm. they didn't. Years later, she found out they she got married and had kids and didn't you know whatever. Mm. But finally, in me, I, I guess she she said, "This kid's gonna make it." That's also like a, I mean, it, like the natural evolution of things. There's a hundred kids that can draw, yeah, you know, and some of them fall off for different reasons, for right. different reasons. Also, opportunities don't come to some or whatever. But you know, in the end, the long haul. Yes, the long haul is for certain people, right? I mean, it's there's yep. different reasons why people fall off. It's, you of know, course, but yeah. So yeah. 
So, but you know, my mother um, always encouraged me to have a backup. <laughs> so mm. in those days, she always said, "What, well, you know, you at least learn to type." Yeah, typing was a big deal. I love exactly, loved and of course, I never did. <laughs> I, I try to tell kids nowadays to learn to type because they're all doing. <laughs> And, and kids do. I mean, they just do because they use... They use their thumbs. No, but they don't type anymore. It's just thumbs and fingers. They use their thumbs, yeah. But but the kids, well, like Ariel and your daughter grew up in the age of computers. So yeah. from the time she was a little kid, she was on Yeah, the they already knew how to where to put their hands and how to type. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So cool. And I, I didn't do it because I didn't want to be able to fall back on anything. I knew I was going to uh, do this. You were and, not giving yourself an option to fall back right. on. Right. I taught, but you know, I'm. I think I'm one of those people who's Teaching just a natural teacher. Teaching is sometimes a means just to keep doing what you're doing. Exactly. Right? Yeah, yeah. Ex- absolutely. It's the best part-time job an artist can have. If yeah. you like to teach, and I always like have always liked to share yeah. what I know and teach people. You know, yeah. give them help with what they're doing to see yeah. whether or not it's really for them. I've always was honest with my students, though. Uh, also, artists have like um, just that they you see things different. Yeah. <laughs> Which is what we were noticing earlier before we started recording, just that, yeah. you know, you see art in, in random objects. Yeah. Um, and uh, sometimes that's what helps you help the kids. I don't know, but I'm just well, having a thought. When you look at their work, you know what they're reaching for. Hmm. Maybe they don't have the tools to get there. Hmm. And so you, you have conversations. Well, what are you trying to do here? What's the da 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 da? Yeah. And, you know, the ones who are serious but who lack the skills. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you can help them. Yeah. You can't help them. You know, there's always that factor with someone who is whose work is special, mm, and yeah. it, you can always tell. Yeah. You know, a, a Martian can come here and yeah, look at Michelangelo just... and go, "Oh my God, <laughs> look at this!" Yeah. It's. I mean, you know, it just reeks yeah. of special, wonderful, unique. You know, you know, a work of art. I mean, something that's great. Um. Those, those, when you, you come across those that. people, you can't teach them. You just kind of point them. Maybe, it depends when right you direction. catch them along the way. Yeah. Um, a lot of you know kids that I knew. Uh, I was I was the first winner of this big scholarship that they gave uh, in 1965 when I was in high school, mm. uh, which enabled me to go to to Otis. Um, that, that was going to be my next question: how how you, how you got to Otis? But yeah, my, my parents, even though the tuition in those days you're going to mm. die, the tuition for a, for a semester was three hundred and twenty five dollars. Wow. <laughs> And that was wow. like in 1969. But my parents didn't have $365 to spend on yeah. tuition. But um, this scholarship made it possible. It was like a $1,000 scholarship, which was in those days like 20000 Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that's how I, I got to Otis. And um, I remember there were the, 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 the kids who were in the competition for that, that scholarship are kids that I had already uh, become acquainted with. By these, uh, by going to these um, honors art courses in high school, mm-hmm. it was the same bunch. You met the same kids. Mm-hmm. All of these kids are super talented. Um, most of them were not kids of color, mm-hmm. and uh, they just seemed like they were on the straight path to being an artist, yeah. right? To, you yeah. know, showing in New York and you know being written about. And almost none of those people ever made it. Mm-mm. They became something else. I don't know what they did. There's one guy. Um, now I forget where I ran into him. He wound up teaching junior college or something. No, two of them wound up doing mm-hmm. that. I mean, not that that's a bad thing, but they never pursued their own careers mm-hmm. after they left. They they had nice careers as teachers. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, but I you know I wanted. I was like Carlos. I mean, that's that's what I, why we're also friends. We I, both had the same ambition. I want to just ask like. So it was 1969 when you went to Otis? Yes. 69. And because now I've interviewed quite a few people, and so many people come from, have gone through Otis. <laughs> it's amazing how many Chicano artists, Chicano Latinx artists have gone through Otis. Yep. Back then, was, it, was there already a cycle of, of people like that, or were you like the first group of Chicanos to like roll through there. We were, <laughs> we were the rarest of rare. You know, the, any yeah. any kid of color there. There were in, in when Otis was the old Otis. It was Otis Art Institute, and it was yeah. right across from MacArthur, MacArthur Park. MacArthur Park, yeah. Uh, it was a very small school. There were only four years 
Mm-hmm. That's why you did two. You did your um, general education <clears throat> requirements. Mm-hmm. Got those out of the way because they weren't going to teach those. Okay. Um, there were four different years, and there weren't any more than a hundred students in each year. So there were a total of maybe four uh, one hundred students in each year graduating. So there were four hundred, you wow. know, at any possibly four hundred at any one time. So it was very small. Everybody knew everybody else. Um, and one thing you didn't see were students of color. When I was there, there were maybe, maybe they had got a little bit of you know consciousness about it being so white. Uh, there were five Latinos. Three of them were completely acculturated, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and there was and me and somebody else. And it stayed that ratio stayed about that way through graduate school. And mm-hmm. that's when I met Carlos. So there were there were two of us who were politicized, and I don't know what happened to the other three. And <laughs> How did you meet Carlos? I mean, oh, shit. in graduate school. Yeah, but I mean, um, was was it? We did went you see to see each other across the room. Wait, I just kicked this camera. Let me just. Oh, did you? Sure oh, still. Okay, we're good. Literally, that's what happened when when uh, when graduate school started. The, we were like what 80, 80 people in the class. So there was this class meeting because we were starting graduate school. It was a different, you know, different process than being an undergrad, right? So they had the first day of, of you know, graduate school. We all met, you know, in the, the lounge and uh, were getting these papers and stuff. And I saw this guy across the room, this kind of thin, wiry-looking guy with a mustache. <laughs> and he had one of those crocheted beanies. Uh, but, you know, his... And looking at him, I thought, that guy looks like he's Middle Eastern or something. I did not see him as being, you know, Latino at all. And then he started talking. And he was educated. He was smart. He was funny. Um, he was impertinent, even <laughs> on the first day of school. And then he said his name was Carlos Almaraz. No, was he still going by Charles? I think he was still using Charles, Charles. for a while. I thought, God damn, this guy is Mexican. I wonder if he's Mexican. <laughs> so, you know, eventually I met him, mm. and uh, I said, Jesus Christ, you know, there's two of us here in graduate. In the graduate school, there were only two of us, wow. me and him. And um, and so we became friends out of necessity. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and he also, we shared a lot in common, and I think that it would really, really glued us together during that period of time. Uh, was the fact that um, we were both trying to find where we fit into the movement Mm. that had just been a couple of years old by that Mm. point. He was coming back from New York. I I had lived in Los Angeles through that time, but as a woman... The time of like the Chicano political movement, right? Yeah, Yeah, you know, the the walkouts began at my high school. I was already out of high school by then, but I I knew some of those people, Moctezuma, Esparza, and those guys. Yeah. Uh, And... You know, everybody was trying to find their place. And if you're a woman, trying to find your place is even tougher. Mm. You know, wh- what are they going to let me do? Mm. What are they going to let me do? <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So it was interesting. But he was he was such a, an open guy. He was, you know, all for women's liberation. He yeah. he didn't, he, he w- that's why he was so interested in Marx. Mm. We went to endless, endless discussion groups all over the city, Marxist leftist wow. group, you know, and it's just like. Um, in fact, I have a copy. You can see it on my. Um, oh, it's behind that picture of Ariel. Yeah. Of the little red book, Miles' little wow. red book, that he gave me. <laughs> That's awesome. Read this. Read get that what to the, the Smithsonian. <laughs> read, read what the chairman says about being an artist. I said, okay, Carlos. I don't think I ever read the whole thing, but yeah, he was very interested in democratizing art. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, that's deep. I mean, to get into um, like each other's lives and then Mm. learn all this stuff together as you're both going to grad school and being surrounded by people that are like Mm. they're in the art world for a different reason, I guess. They're in the art world to like you know try to become blue chip artists and all that, yeah, and 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 make money, yeah, make money and and, um, make their parents happy. That's not to say we didn't have the same ambition. Amaras and I, you know, often confess to one another 
that when we, you know, when we were growing up, we would look at these, these, you know, the, yeah. you go to the museums and stuff because that was free. You know, my mother took us anywhere it was free and cultural. Yeah, yeah. Same. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and um, I mean, you you saw the greatness of this work, and who doesn't want to aspire to that? If you think, you yeah. know, that at some point you're you have the the skills, right? But we also knew that you know it was like joining the army. Yeah. Eventually, it dawned on us. I think the movement. We've got to spend our time in doing this. We have to. Um, we we have to be helpful in, in any way we can. We we we're not political operatives. We're not organizers in that yeah. sense. But as artists, we bring visual skills. Mm -hmm. And if you think about any great revolution, there's always been a great logo. There's always yeah. been great posters. I mean, the Cuban Revolution produced this immense graphic, you know, the tradition. Yeah. Um, the Russian Revolution Russian. is like yeah. as well. And so we knew we had we had things we could offer, um, and that's and that that was our part. That would that was our place. That's what we did, and we weren't sure how long it was going to take, but. Certainly, by the end of the '70s, we knew that it was over. Mm. I mean, it wasn't over. I mean, it's never over. It's never over. <laughs> Donald Trump is fucking yeah. proof that it's never over. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, you, you you do your bit. You know, yeah. you do what you you know you wanted to, and it's like the ne next generation has to pick yeah. up you know the thread from there. And so we yeah. thought we can go back to being artists again, doing what we want to do. And that's. I'm I'm trying to like put two words that feeling of like I did a lot of work already, you know, like I did the grunt work and you do kind of like then rely on the next generation to like pick up some of that. Yep. And then That's the way it should be. How else yeah. do you pass on like to your kids? Yeah. You know, you 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 give them you arm them with all the things they need. And then you let it, you let them go. Because it's the same fight a lot of times. It's the it same is. fight over and over and over again. It is. Yeah. This last, well, you know, since 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 the the, the Republican takeover, you know, of, of politics with Donald Trump, I I thought those times were gone. I thought, you know, what we did forty years ago, or forty five years ago, now, I guess, had moved us to a point where you know real change would happen. I never, ever thought that we would step back so far as a country. Yeah. It's been shocking and disappointing these last two or three years to see that happen. Yeah. And it doesn't seem to be... Um, it's going to take longer, I think, to put this back in the box where it belongs yeah. than it did the first time. Ooh. Wow. And so your daughter and my daughter are going to be stuck with these fools. Yeah. For the rest of their lives, because and these young kids that are growing up listening to this now, yeah, on that end of this exactly of this fight exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, so foolishly, I thought that you know we really had accomplished something permanent. Yeah. <laughs> we did in the sense that you know we empowered young Mexican Americans to, to think of themselves in a different way. Mm -hmm. That you can be part of the society without giving up who you are. It's the way that I always explain why. Why we were different from white hippie kids in the 70s. Mm. I mean, I knew a lot of white hippie kids because they were at Otis, right? Mm. And I thought, why are they the way they are? Why are they going to f all this in these foreign cultures, you know, the Harry Krishnas and the. Mm. Well, they're white, they're Europeans. <laughs> why are they doing this? And it finally dawned on me they are in search of a culture mm -hmm. that they lost. We have never been out of touch with our language, with the culture of our people. Mm -hmm. It's the reason that we, that's a, it's a, maybe the reason that I didn't, I wasn't, you know, a hippie. It didn't, it f felt like a farce. I mean, to, you know, to me, I thought it, it seemed ridiculous that they should be, you know, uh, what, what am I looking at? S scavenging other people's culture <laughs> because they don't have one anymore. I mean, I just... And then I and then I felt sorry for them. Well, God, you know. Yeah, there's a part of you that does feel that way. There's a there's a whole documentary that I saw on that on um, this guru. Uh, <laughs> uh -huh. I, I forgot the name of it, but anyways, um, <clears throat> wow. 
So after um, Otis, how did you guys um, move forward? And, and after uh, Otis, um, okay. Well, we we exited Otis in '74, hmm. and so uh, things were. It was in the middle of you know middle of the of the decade. Staying, things were there was still a lot to do politically, and that's how we spent the 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 second half the second half of the '70s. You know, uh, Carlos um, struck up a, a wonderful, you know, friendship with uh, Cesar Chavez. Oh yeah. Um, he absolutely loved Carlos, and so, and, and uh, you know, a few occasions I would go up to La Paz, you know, mm-hmm. with Carlos to work on some stuff up there. Uh, and um, I mean, I, I appreciated the farm workers, you know, thing, and it was really important to do. Mm-hmm. But I was more interested in doing, you know, the cultural. Um, um, what am I looking for? Artistic support, you know, to things that uh, that that were important to Chicanas. Mm-hmm. So I wound up doing. So do you think that separated like the inner city Chicanos to the rural or farm no, worker Chicanos? No, because I I I have people from you know who who are Central Valley people, mm-hmm. and when I was a child, we'd go up there and pick stuff. Mm-hmm. I mean would not spend a day in the field. We'd go out and pick a few things and come home, right? <laughs> <laughs> I actually worked a couple summers in the field. Did you really? Uh, no, we did, no, our parents would let us do that, but our, our one of our uncles was a foreman of this you know, ranch, and okay. so he would take Let us out. There and play yeah, around, just, yeah. It, was, it was to show us you know, what yeah. it's like. You know? Andale, aprende algo or right. It's, it's you hard, can, huh? Can you thought it was here, easy? Yeah. It's not so easy. Uh, but... Um, what was I going to say? Where were we? What were we talking about? About uh, the the you wanted to do stuff that was. Oh yeah, so so it, you know, and and there were other people who were who were who fit into that world better than I. I mean, mm. I'm an urban person, right? Got it. Yeah. And uh, I understand, you know, urban better than I do rural. So I wound up doing a lot of um, graphic things for what it, what in those days were incipient. Uh, Chicano organizations like uh, the mm. Chicano Service Action Center mm-hmm. and um, Comisión Femenil. And so I, I was funny, I was just looking at some of those things uh, when I was sh- you know, looking through some of my old uh, slides. And um, yeah, I mean, w- the women who, who, that I knew from those days who organized locally, um, are some of the most amazing, you know, women I have ever met. Uh, uh, Irena Cervantes, you know, the wonderful artist that she is, and and just dedicated, you know, to education and mm. and the advancement of, you know, of women. Um, who else? Um, all of the women from San Francisco who I became friends with, uh, the women from Sacramento, we we bonded, I think, in a way that the men did not, because there were so few of us. Mm. And uh, those friendships have lasted. I still see Tere Romo, archivist and curator. And mm. I didn't know Yolanda Lopez, mm. unfortunately. I, I never met her. Um, uh, <laughs> I don't know if this is is going to shock some people, but in the seventies, yeah, I was in yeah, I was in the mid seventies. Yeah, it was not too too much after Otis. Uh, I was in a relationship with. Uh, um, um, you forgot their name. <laughs> <laughs> I'm blanking on his name. Oh my God, isn't that awful? Uh, he just died a couple of years ago. Oh. <laughs> it's the, oh shit. Um, Renee Yanez. Oh, okay, yes. Um, From the we cultural met center. During the, yeah, yeah. the, 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 Galeria de, 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 de la Raza in San Francisco. Mission, yeah. Right. Um, uh, I'm sorry, Renee. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, we met during the Concilio thing. You know, mm. we, Carlos and I had been up north, you know, meetings, and I met Renee, and we, we had a relationship for a while. So that was pre Yolanda. And then um, we had an amicable, you know, split because it was too hard, you know, for him to come, you know, and for me to go there. Um, but through him, I met these, you know, these great women. Um, Carmen, uh, Carmen from Texas, the one who does those beautiful little drawings. Uh, Carmen. Not sure. Shit, I can't remember her name. 
But yeah, I mean, there was there was a great bond from yeah. you know of women from that time that that and those are the women who did something. Mm. You know, they have had careers and they have had an effect um, on how you know young Chicanas look upon you know careers in art, careers in education because. And and the work that was coming out back then, what like informed it? Was it the movement? Was it? Um, Absolutely. Well, that's what drew us together. Yeah. The fact that the the um, the events that we met at were part social, but mostly political, and uh, things that had an agenda. So dur people. during that time, were you doing like art shows and galleries, or was it just like design and graphic stuff? We were. Stuff? We were. Yeah. Um, yeah. The um, I think it was Michicano actually had the first or second um, all women. All you know, Chicana show mm. uh, at the you know the old Michicana here on mm. uh, on uh, Figueroa, and there was one at the Women's Building. All of these were in the seventies. Mm. Um, it was very unusual. There weren't. I don't know if black women were having shows either. I didn't didn't know many artists from the from the African American community, but um, yeah, women were you know rising up. I mean, you know the the bras had been burned. Yeah. And, you know, everybody was trying to do something to raise, you know, the, uh, the confidence. So then there was like a shift from the, oh, what do you call it, the farm workers to like the women's rights? Actually, it was a mix. I mean, mix you know, for, for a certain amount of time you did this and then there would be, can you come and yeah. help me do this? And so we'd go and do that. It was very mixed. I mean, it was, yeah. a, you're kind of on call. It was like. Yeah. Being an you know, EMT guy. Yeah. <laughs> we need a poster stat. <laughs> really, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Tr truly. I mean, that's exactly the way it was. When we were at the building that's on Figueroa that, that's being renovated now. Mm -hmm. or the one that We were in the building next to it. Right across from the, from the Highland Park Theater. Yeah, the theater. So you're talking about... We are on the second floor. The Centro Cultural, right? Um, yeah. One night, Richard Dardo was printing, and he said... Judith, are you are you free to, to do something? I have I have a job. I have to do this poster for blah blah blah. Okay, <laughs> so you know that's the way it happened. It was very spontaneous. Yeah. You didn't know what was going to happen on any given day. People would come in and say, you know, can you drop what you're doing? We're having a march. We're having a event. You know, we need you know help. Da 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 da. Yeah. It was very fluid. Yeah. Yeah. That's a lot of years of political art. Yes, right. it was ten years, just yeah. about ten years, yeah. for me anyway. Was there was there a time when you think you shifted from political to like your dreamscape type work, or it happened in the late seventies when things wound down, hmm. and I I was um, a little kind of you know at that point um, felt like I had done what I needed to do, or or felt like I. It was really time for me to move on to something else. Mm -hmm. I had, I had, I given my time and my effort, and I felt okay about you know mm -hmm. finally doing something that I wanted to do. And so yeah, I, it's not that I hadn't had those thoughts, you know, in, t in terms of you know um, the imagery that I wanted to do. I would already have sketchbooks and stuff that have you know those pre uh, in those images and it. You know, in their infancy, but I knew I wanted to take those further. So, the only way to do that was to get a a, a job, a day job, <laughs> <laughs> that would support you know yeah. my career as a as a fine artist. So, yeah, I began teaching. I well, actually I started teaching right out of uh, out of Otis in '74. Um, what's his name? Roberto Chavez, mm -hmm. who was the um, first director of the Chicano, Chicano Studies program, I think, at ELAC, mm. hired me to teach. Wow. It was funny, you know, I, I met him during the first PST, you know, in mm. 2011, oh, and yeah. I, I hadn't seen him in God, you know, decades, right? And I, <laughs> I, I walked up to him and you know, said, hello, he's very elderly. I said, you know, you hired me to teach, you know, at East LA. He said, I'm sorry, I don't remember you. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> But yeah, I taught there for like 10 years, and I taught at Cerritos, and I taught at, yeah, it, it just... Teaching art, of course. Yeah, art yeah. history, actually. Oh, okay. uh, yeah, you know, getting getting a job in the art department um, full-time, you had to wait for someone to die yeah. or to retire. 
So I always had part-time jobs and, you know, living expenses then were not that great. Yeah. You know, I mean, as high as they are now. So it was easy to do. To and on a, a part-time Yeah, two or three salary, part-time yeah. jobs did it, right? And you were good. Gas was only 25 cents a gallon. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I mean, yeah, really. <laughs> wow. I want to shift a little bit. Sure. To... um. Like your style of narrative, storytelling, mm. dreamscape, or is it dream? Um, just, I guess, try to explain. I guess, you know, when, when people ask me what I do, it, uh, I like, you know, if, if you have to put some, some sort of, you know, label on it, uh, I think that, you know, I'm very comfortable with, you know, what many people have, have you know, put me in the school of ma magical realism, although it's, that's usually confined mm -hmm. to a literary mm -hmm. artist. Mm -hmm. I, I think they're extending it now to visual artists as well. Definitely makes sense. And so that's where I fit in. Um, I, I was um, a student of Charles White. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was a huge influence. Did he teach at Otis? Yes. He oh, was wow. the one right. non-white wow. faculty member. All the time that I was but there. But his last name was White, so. I know. I was, <laughs> That's funny. Maybe that made him okay. <laughs> but he was a huge influence, and he, um, we were very much alike, and I think that's why we got along so well. Mm. Um, he also, I think, saw in me what, what uh, my high school teacher saw in me, and that was someone who, you know, has, has things to say and will have the ability to do that in a mm. profound way if they will let her. Mm. And um, and Charlie had faced the same obstacles that he knew that I would mm. as a man of color, and we would talk and we would talk about that on occasion. He told me once about his trip to Mexico with his first wife, and how that was a monumental trip for him. In that, people gave him the kind of respect simply because he was an artist. Mm that he had never received in his own country. Wow. It didn't matter that he was black. Who cares? Look at his work. Yeah. And, you know, I, in fact, I used to call him maestro, which he thought was very <laughs> funny. I that's said, well, good. that's what they would call you in Mexico. Um, and he was, he, he was so supportive. Uh, when I did my master's thesis, I decided to go very rogue. And I said, you know, I, I got my group together. He was on my thesis committee. So it was Joe Muyaini. Wow. Uh, and I said to them, you know, I want to do, uh, I want to do a series of work, but I want to do it in an urban um, aerosol spray style. Mm. And they sort of, you mean like graffiti? <laughs> I said exactly like graffiti. Okay, mm. <laughs> go for it, wow. go for it. You know, they these were guys who'd been trained you know, by Renaissance, you know. Mm. Uh, professors, and most of them in Europe, uh, with the exception of Charles White, and but they were so open-minded. They said, "Yeah, go, that sounds really interesting. Go for it." Wow. And so I produced all this work, you know, in a in a this you know, urban graffiti style. I mean, it's really tame stuff when you compare it to what's being done now, but. I think it was certainly a first. But using know, the spray can was a big deal. For yeah, to do right. it in a use it as an art, a fine art yeah. tool, and also to be a woman, yeah. to be doing that. I think it was pretty much a first. Uh, the work is still is probably some of the most coveted work that I have. People always ask really? me, "Do you have any more of the old?" I said, "You know, some of them just disappeared. Who knows where the hell they are?" And there's there's only. There's three pieces that are in museums. That, you know, there's one at MoMA, mm -hmm. and there's one at the Crocker Museum, and I think there's one somewhere else, and those are the only ones that I know of that still exist. I don't have any. Well, we got to get you a spray can. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too old to do that anymore. I can't reach high enough. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but I did a mural with my, my cousin over on, on, on Pico, Okay. And the West Side, that was completely, this was also 1974, it was completely spray can. in spray can. Wow. I think it was the first graffiti mural in the city. I, you know, not, it wasn't graffiti, it was yeah. a mural. Sanctioned mural, I guess. But it was all <laughs> done in spray can. Wow. Yeah, so 
I know kids now, they think they invented it. <laughs> Por favor. Well, there, there, there is a good amount of um, graffiti history being taught. So a, yes. a lot of kids now, they're lucky they get to pick up books that yeah. have like a tremendous amount of history in the graffiti world. Absolutely. Where like in the 80s when I grew up, there, those books didn't really exist yet. Maybe a couple magazines here and then. Right. But, but, um, yeah. but yeah, the history is, is deep. Yeah, art historians, you know, the, the, the younger ones have taken that up. And yeah. yeah, there is. There's a lot of information now. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> so I want to know a little bit about... Um, mm. Did you want to say something for No, 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 I hit the mic. Oh, it's okay. I want to know a little bit about how it... I know that you were friends with um, Carlos Almaraz and and that, but the, how did it happen that you ended up um, being a part of Los Four? And it was Carlos's idea. Okay. He, he was... Um, I mean, Los Four had already made, made a name for themselves. Mm. And, you know, the, the other three were very happy to keep it that way. <laughs> <laughs> But Carlos, being a Marxist-Leninist person, mm. uh, and a, and a uh, you know, in, in believing in, in, in you know, equality for women, um, and the fact that Asco had a woman. Yes. Said, yes. you know, if we want respect, uh, you know, we need, and you know, if we're going to walk, walk the walk, and not just talk the talk, we need a woman in the yeah. group. Well, we're Los Four. I said, so what? You know, Los Four can be <laughs> it's you know, still 20 Los Four. Yeah. La una, so. <laughs> right. So I, I never expected them to change the name. It was just, yeah. you know, you know, he he he, env he envisioned it as being kind of all encompassing of lots of different people mm. that would rotate through. But why don't we just start by adding a woman? So um, uh, it was also fueled by the fact that I was at least as good as they were, if not better, my mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. And they insisted on having a portfolio to look at. So I have to... Wow. They didn't <laughs> submit their portfolios. But, oh, and, that's awesome. and one of them famously said, and I, to this day I don't know who it was, and they said, wow, yeah, she's good. She draws like a man. Wow. <laughs> So on that basis, they admitted me to the group. And this was right after the LACMA show. No, it was before the LACMA show. Wow. But I wasn't really officially in the show mm. because I had not been part of the, of the show that, that traveled from, what is it? I, I think it was UC Irvine where mm. the first Los Four show was. And okay. they, they traveled that show to LACMA and then expanded it because the galleries were bigger there. Um, so my work was not in that. So, But I'm I'm in the you know the video and stuff. So how was it coexisting with like Osco at the same time? Osco are riches. younger than we were. Okay. I was closer to their age because uh, I think I'm five years older than Patsy. But the guys in in Los Four were anywhere from eight to ten years older than I was. Yeah. So I was not only the woman; I was the youngest. Mm. And um, I I didn't know the, the Osco people. I. I saw them from afar and thought, well, I will never be that cool. Yeah, just, they were like the... I just was like, you know, old-fashioned compared, you know, old-fashioned revolutionary type, you know, art compared to their, you know, yeah. their take on things was so ahead of its time. Yeah. Uh, I'm so so happy that they had that Osco show. Yeah. Uh, so you could see, you know, what these people were doing and thinking and how they were translating Uh, their message in such a unique and interesting way for the time. Wow. I thought they were <clears throat> tremendous. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, Patsy and I are very good friends now. But that only happened after I came back. Over the last 10 years. I didn't came know Came back her, from? From Chicago. Oh, from Chicago. I've only really, we've been, you know, we've started to become friends over the last 10 years because prior to that, we knew each other, but we, we were not, we didn't have a relationship. Yeah. Wow. I just thought that she was unapproachable, and so I, you know. She probably I, felt the same way, too. Or You know, she's very private as well. Yeah. So, okay. uh, but now as old ladies, we're, we're good buddies. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's awesome. Um, what is the difference in approaching, like, public art and, like, something that you're just going to work on in your studio? Oh, it's a world of difference. Yeah. Uh, I, it's... It's easiest described by saying that you know the murals who who become very very quickly obliterated mm. by you know taggers and mm. stuff. Oh God, that's horrible right now. 
Yeah, are generally murals that um, didn't serve the the didn't serve the people who have to live with it every day. Mm -hmm. I, I'm very annoyed by by you know people who who do public art um, and think that whatever they choose to give a community, they should they should be grateful for. Um, sorry. This is their neighborhood. They should have approval. They should they should like what's going up, and 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 of course your punishment is if it isn't what they like, it's not going to last. Yeah. Every mural I've ever done in the city, you know, and it hasn't been a lot. I'm not a muralist. I'm just somebody who's done a few murals. Uh, they have rarely ever been tagged mm. to death. Um, the the the. Um, the, the piece that I restored in, at Ramona Gardens in 2016 uh, was up for about 40 years. It had a few little thingies, but nothing major. It was mostly time that had aged it. Hmm. But um, that certainly can't be said for, you know, like all the, the and it's unfortunate, so the murals on the, on the freeway I liked. Yeah. Like the, the, the Terry Schoenhoven mural that, yeah, that crumbling, you know, columns, yeah, the, Greek the columns. The planets. Yeah, that yeah, was beautiful. Well, I think all those mural. on the freeway are gorgeous. And uh, part of the reason why, I'm not sure, but I think part of the reason why taggers approach them is because of the visibility. And so they put their name on top of it. Yep. It won't get painted over for a long time because <laughs> they have to be careful how they, you know, just cover over a mural. Yeah. And uh, they'll get their spot for a very long time, you know. I mean, that's yeah. what that's what that gig is all about, is, you know, getting a spot that lasts mm -hmm. for a I long suppose. time with but, a lot of visibility, yeah. Well, yeah, it just gets, I mean, it, but it turns into just this huge mess. I it's mean, horrible. It's really bad. And it's, I don't know, you know, and, and, and some of the, the pieces that they're, you know, that they cover with graffiti were certainly nice. Yeah. Nothing, nothing wrong with that. You know, Ken Twitchell has been, yeah. these things have been butchered, but. You know, I would say then rather than, okay, my, my personal opinion is is that all murals have an expiration date mm. because they're very, generally they're topical. Yeah. And so you shouldn't expect it to last forever. Yeah. Frankly, most public art isn't that kind of art. Yeah. It's not, I mean, you can take a photograph of it to immortalize it, but it shouldn't last forever. Yeah. And at some point, as, as an artist, you shouldn't be upset when a younger artist wants you to surrender that wall to mm. them yeah. and let them have a shot. Yeah. Fine with me. Yeah. And that's, that's a really interesting um, point that uh, you're the second person that has expressed that to me. So really? that's, yeah, that's, that's a really good um, way to look at it because it's just, it's not permanent. It's not permanent. <laughs> it's not permanent. It's not yeah. the, the Sistine Chapel either. Yeah, you know, yeah, so yeah. no, yeah. they shouldn't last forever. They should, that's why I mean you know if these guys who just did the 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 what are the Sixth Street Bridge? Yeah. Apparently they're they're fighting graffiti every day on that. Of course. Yeah. yeah. So you didn't know that was going to happen, yeah. boy. Oops. <laughs> of course. But you know they didn't build in some wall space where they could have contained it and said Ooh. these are going to be public walls available. You can sign up for them, do your thing. Mm. It lasts for six months, and then we're going to paint it white, and then the next crew can come in and do. It. And 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 you know that would have produced some interesting stuff. That I would think. have been nice, actually. Yeah. Instead of worrying about, oh, are they going to tag it today? Where do we have to send the paint crew? Da 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 da. da you know. Yeah. yeah. Well, public art. Yes, public art. Um, I'm jumping around now because I'm I'm going to my notes here. Um, sure. But uh, I did notice somewhere that you also did some work with the Teatro Campesino. Yeah, we, I don't know if you could call it work. I, I personally didn't do anything for them mm. graphically. But uh, Carlos and uh, Luis Valdez were very good friends. Mm. And um, um, mostly that was kind of a pit stop on the way to San Francisco, at least with the times that I went with him. Mm. Um, they're a great bunch of people. Actors are so wonderful. And they're so entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> and we'd, we'd stay with his, uh, uh, Luis's sister, um, oh, the little one, what was her name? She was hysterical. Um, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on her name. I just know the brother. <laughs> I uh, forgot her name. Yeah, Yeah, she's, she's real tiny. She's so cute. She was married. Funny, I, I, I remember her ex-husband, Alan. His name was Alan. 
I forget her name. Anyway, we'd stay with, you know, in their apartment uh, in San Juan and uh, just have this rip-roaring time. You know, they were, they were great. Uh, but I don't, I don't know. I, to tell you the truth, I don't know what Carlos did for, for Luis in terms of, the, you know, theater, um, you know, set design or anything. I, I'm, I don't really know. Okay. Um, so now to get back to um, your work and, mm -hmm. and specifically um, the type of um, imagery that you create, if you could kind of, if there is a way to explain like where it comes from or, or um, you know, I guess each piece is different, but. You know, I found over, you know, over the, my, my lifetime that um, it's better if I didn't try to analyze, overanalyze myself too much. Mm. I think it's in the way that I, I am still, I am still in possession of that, I think, critical kind of thing that some artists, and I'm only guessing here, I could be totally wrong, seem to lose is um, that kind of, you know, childlike wonderment and curiosity about mm. things. Mm. I mean, I, I've seen, you know, so many things in my life a million times, and I still find them mm. amazing every time I see them. I drive my daughter crazy when we're, we're walking past the, the flower things into, into, into Trader Joe's. Oh, look <laughs> at the color of these flowers. Yes, they were the same color last week. <laughs> <laughs> But look how beautiful it's the only Mother Nature can make this color. Uh, stuff like that never ceases to be absolutely amazing to me. Mm -hmm. And I think that when I sit down you know, to think through, I, well, back up a little bit. Now that I, I still have, you know, that, that point of view about wanting to, um, that's fueled by this curiosity, it's also, it's all, I've, all, I've also chosen to put it into a path that serves a point, which mm. is why I do things in series. Mm. It gives me the opportunity to explore an idea that I'm interested in, like um, the colonization is the new one that I've taken on. Mm. And I waited a long time to do that because that story is so immense mm. and so tragic in so many ways that I, I, you know, for the first time in my life, I was kind of stumped. How do I do that in a, in a graphic way that isn't a turn off? Mm. I think one of the things that draw has always drawn people to my work mm. before they get punched <laughs> mm. is the fact that it's beautiful. Mm. People are absorbed by the color, you know, by the form. Um, and then they suddenly, you know, it dawns on them what this all means. Mm -hmm. And that's the way I've chosen to draw them in. I think, you know, beauty is something that is so integral to the human nature mm -hmm. that, you know, the, the appeal of it is undeniable. You, you know, you're drawn to those things. And it's only after you're, they've drawn you in mm -hmm. do you realize there's something else going on there. That, that was one of my notes here. It says, images are a contrast of strong, hard ideas Mm -hmm. and beautiful colors. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it is. So it you is draw in, and then you teach them a little bit, or maybe not teach, but... I ask questions, I do do yeah. things. I will tell a story. It's not like, it's not like in-your-face teaching. Right, or I, I ask a question. Because mm -hmm. a, lot of what I do, a lot of what I do is open-ended. In a certain series, like the Adam and Eve series, mm -hmm. which is you know about human relationships, mm -hmm. everybody has probably almost everyone on the planet has had a human relationship of some sort and can read into these pieces whatever they like. It's not necessarily about a heterosexual couple. I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to hit you. It's okay. um, I, only, I only use them because they're the most famous couple in the world. Got it. Who doesn't know who yeah. Adam and Eve is? Even if you're in Tibet, you know who Adam and Eve are. Mm -hmm. And so that sets up a premise here. This is about relationships. And then people can sort that out any way they want. Um, and this way you can create like chapters in your narrative, for example, as a way to look at it? Not or? so much chapters, but, you know, glimpses. It's mm. like, you know, 
you're, you know, you have access to a peephole, and every time you look into it, you know, the what's in what's what's there to see has changed, mm. and so you can only glimpse it for a while. Mm. You know, I I've always been, um, my whole life I've always been something of an egghead. I I love to read. Um, I like to think about things that are not easy to think about, which is philosophy, basically. Mm. And so I've read a lot of philosophy. <laughs> a friend of mine in Chicago, I gave him a copy of um, Octavio Paz's Labyrinth of Solitude mm. to teach him about what it is to be Mexican. This man's mm. German. And he gave me a copy of, of Wittgenstein, which is a modern philosopher. I got about two pages into that as a... There's no way. <laughs> There's no way I'm getting this stuff. But um, I don't know. I I, I want art. I, I think the best art is is intelligent art. Mm -hmm. the, the people who fascinate you with with a uh, with um, with an idea, with a feeling, with a something that they can portray. I mean, a guy like Turner, you're simply blown away by his interpretation of a sunset or a dawn. Mm. I mean, it's so lush and so beautiful and so perfect. Uh, and then, you know, you look at a guy like Dolly, which makes you uncomfortable almost to the point of, oh my God, you know, this is, this is a dream I had. <laughs> um, into the magnificence of, you know, the, the paintings of da Vinci, the, the sculpture of Michelangelo. All of those artists bring a particular point of view to a, to a subject that informs people in a way that no one else could have informed them. Mm. And it won't speak to everyone, but the ones who get it have gotten something really special. Mm. And I, I, think that, I think that's the business of art, and that's probably the most elusive and the hardest thing to do. But I've always been attracted by the elusive and the difficult, so... I'll be doing that yeah. <laughs> for the foreseeable future. <laughs> and you do it beautifully. So. Uh, I try. I try. Yeah. I, I mean, actually try. I mean, this is my job. I mean, thank God I love it so much. I just, I want people, you know, to, to get something out of my work, not just think about, oh, that would look great over my sofa. <laughs> That's not the point. <laughs> I don't know why that made me laugh so much, but I know what you're saying. Yeah, you know, I, I don't do art like that. I don't do... If, if, if you could, I mean, take your time with this. Sure. But if you could kind of um, explain what your process is to even, like, come up with, like, a... Oh, there's like a definite that. process. Absolutely. Yeah. I, uh, if it's for something historical, like the, the, like the colonization, you mm -hmm. know, uh, work. Um, I do a lot of research. Hmm. You know, I know, I know how to do research, and uh, uh, I read a lot. You can see I have a pretty. You know, it's, it's not the library I once had, but I have. You know, books everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, I have lots of books. Um, I know my daughter and I collect books like people collect. I don't know what else. <laughs> uh, but um, I do research, and then I try to find. Um, not a theme, but a direction, you know, for what I'm getting to and see see where that leads me and see, you know, what what makes sense to, you know, and, and an order of how those things may be presented. And then it could also be as free form as what the, the work from uh, the Luchadora, which is, you know, every once in a while something will, will just come up. And I think, oh my God, that that could be a series, a yeah. series of, of you know, or part of that series, like the work that I did for the um, for the Cola Fellowship. Mm -hmm. I didn't know I was going to do that when I got it. It was just something that I had been toying with, and I thought, well, this is my opportunity. I'm getting paid for it too. You know, to limit my palette, I I, I do that periodically just because as a uh, I, I think like, you know, like, I sort of liken it to being an athlete where you change your exercise routine mm. just because... You work on your leg muscles one day, you work right. on your arm muscles another and day. And so, yes, I handle color pretty well, but it, sometimes I, I love to limit my palate mm. 
just because it's more challenging to try to do what I want to do with much fewer color, with mm. much less color. Um, one of the guys who taught us a lot at Otis, I mean, if you're willing to, he's a very strange fellow. Um, he was, a, what, did, what do they call him, a, a California modernist, a guy named Bentley Shad, who was probably one, one of the most, I don't know, eerie men I've ever met in my life. He was, <laughs> he was a man of such psychological tightness. You know, there was something wow. going on with him. He was, he was, um, he was uh, obsessive compulsive. His clothes never had you know, anything on them. There was no paint. There was no, I mean, wow. he dressed like a businessman. And yet his work was very painterly. And he, he didn't speak much. Um, and the, the greatest compliment he could give you is when he, he would go by and see what you were doing. And he would just look at you and then walk on. Mm. If he stopped to talk, you knew you were in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he was also the guy who, the first day we went to class, he said to us, you're going to need five colors in this class. And we all looked at each other. He says, you're going to need ultramarine blue, sienna, black, white, and I think it was, I forget what the other, a raw umber. You're going to do that all semester. Wow. And we're going to, I'm going to set up, you know, challenges for you. You can do a lot with those five colors. Wow. And yes, we were forced to work with that, those five colors for an entire semester. And it was one of the best exercises in my life for, you know, as a young artist to be wow. forced to think that way. I, and, and so I do that to myself now. Even after all these years, yeah. 50 years of doing this, I still, you know, don't want to get so comfortable. I think, you know, I have contemporaries, you know. God bless them. You know, I don't want, I don't want somebody to you know, listen to this and start thinking, she's talking about me. <laughs> but they become so comfortable about in what they do yeah. that there's, you know, they're just repeating their greatest success, and it's so boring. Mm. And I just wish that they would force themselves to do something that's way out of their yeah their their comfort zone and refresh their you know the way they look at their Shake own work. Shake themselves up a little bit. I try to do that. Yeah. So I like that a lot. Um, we're winding down. Okay. Um, time wise, but I want to ask you if there's anything that we haven't talked about that you would like to talk about, share with us. Oh, gosh, gosh, gosh. What haven't we talked about? Um, oh, I, I think, and every artist probably has, you know, a friend in a different discipline or friends in a different discipline that help them sort out their thought, you know, thoughts, mm. you know, that as they pertain to what they do. But in the last several years, one of the one of the influences that has um, helped me a lot personally, uh, because they're wonderful people. I used to think of them as the enemy. I really did, <laughs> <laughs> because so much of what they would write about me was wrong. Mm. Historians, as a okay. group, uh, so much so much of the day that you know, and unfortunately, they were not Mexican Americans who were mm. writing about Chicano artists. Mm -hmm. They were non-Chicanos, you know, who mm -hmm. first thought, wow, here's, here's, I'm, you know, I'm doing a PhD and this has not been talked about. Yeah. So they seized on it and they got it wrong. And um, in the last 20 years, I've met so many, you know, historians who are Latinos who are in fact beginning to write that, rewrite, correct mm -hmm. that history. And they're mostly women and they have been so helpful um, and 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 so interested in getting it right. Mm. They have dug down and written, you know, books. Um, uh, you know, people like uh, like uh, Karen Karen Mary Davola, uh, D mm. Davalos Davalos. and uh, uh, Charlene Villasenor Black, who's writing a book about me. Yeah, <laughs> it's so exciting. And I mean, so many women that I know who are brilliant historians. And they're choosing, and thank God, you know, they're one of us, and their interest is in Chicano art and Chicano culture, uh, and they're making things right. Yeah. And they're, and they're and they're sharing their passion for that with their Latino students, who will then do the same thing for their generation, and that that's very exciting. 
it's it's uh, important to have somebody that writes about you. Oh God, yes, and it has to be somebody who's like you. Yeah. No matter how empathetic you are, it's not the same. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> well, do you have a, a website that people can find? Yes, you I do. Yeah. yeah, it's Judith Hernandez. Judith Hernandez, and we'll put that down below. Com. Yeah, and uh, you know people. And it happens very often. People misspell my first name. It's like Patsy. There's an E at the end. There is an E at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, it's Judith with a J-U-D-I-T-H-E. My mother, well, my mother was a Shakespeare fan. Interesting. Oh. Yeah. And so I'm a Shakespeare fan. Me too. And his daughter, they the old English spelling had an E. Oh, okay. And Shakespeare's so, actual daughter. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, hence. I didn't even know he had kids. <laughs> he did. <laughs> Yeah, they didn't see much of him, but... <laughs> yeah, I imagine. Um, so there's a question that we ask everybody at the end of each sure. episode. And um, the challenge is to answer in one sentence, if you can. Oh, wow. Yeah, and, um, but it's it's a vague question, so you can give me a vague answer. <laughs> okay. You can answer anything, actually. And um, if a being from another planet like came down and saw your entire you know, archive of work and, and um, understood like everything that you've done and all the things that you've been through and, and how you made it through hard times and, and got to this point if, if uh, they just came in front of you. How would you answer if they asked, Judith Hernandez, how do you do it? How do I do it? I'd like to think that I do it um, according to, the, to a, a quote by the great Octavio Paz, which is, Beyond myself, somewhere, I wait for my arrival. Beautiful. <laughs> That's beautiful. Beyond myself, somewhere. I wait for my I arrival. Wait for my arrival. Wow. I have yet to arrive. If I always think of myself as not actually arrived, yeah. then I keep working. Yeah. Wow. That's all. But it's also like a metaphysical. Yes, it is. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for coming and bringing all your stuff. I thought you had a crew, and you, no. you walk in with one guy carrying all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> one man gang. Uh, yeah, I wish I had a producer. So there's there's somebody out there that really wants to produce. I'd love to. You know, you know I think someone. I can help you with that. All right, let's talk. Hey, what did John Valadez say to that to that question? What question? The last one you asked me. Oh God! How did, did he, he answer say? it? I forgot. <laughs> but it was something, you know, fun. Uh, of course. Yeah, yeah. I'll have to I just watch. do it or something like that, you know. <laughs> I'll have to I just watch. do it because I have to or something like that. I'll have to watch the video again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, thank you so much. I, I do appreciate you giving us this time to um, sit here. And hopefully we can do this again in a year or something. Oh, yeah. We can get into more details about your process and stuff. But, very um, good. Very happy to have you. Thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me. See you guys next week. <laughs>